So good afternoon to everybody. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here with a special live broadcast. Going to try something different here on YouTube. 13 years ago, um, <laughs> just getting text messages coming in. People are like, whoa, you're streaming live. 13 years ago, right now, we were uh, just dealing with the second part of Hurricane Charlie after the eye passed over. Uh, Charlie made landfall in the Port Charlotte area on August 13th, 2004, and there was four of us that were with the Hurricane Track team that were there. It was myself, uh, my friend Eddie Smith, uh, Jesse Bass, and John Van Pelt. The four of us left North Carolina to go down to uh, the Florida Panhandle first for Tropical Storm Bonnie, and then eventually Hurricane Charlie. And of course, we had no idea of how strong Charlie would be at landfall. It was a Category 4, and uh, it was something else. So what I'm going to do is sort of set things up and set the stage. You know, I could come in and just play the video, and that's that. But, you know, you got to set things up and sort of take people back and let them understand where things were uh, and how they played out 13 years ago. So this is the advisory package from the National Hurricane Center. Of course, it was first named on Monday, August 9th. And uh, we can go back over here and see that on the graphics. And hopefully this is all coming through normally. It looks like it is. And it was over here just north of Trinidad and Tobago, the center of circulation. And the five-day forecast was for it to uh, eventually make its way over to near Jamaica. We'll make this a little larger. And um, that was about it, or was it a three-day forecast back then? I don't remember. Isn't that sad? Uh, day, potential day one to three track area. So maybe it was just three days. <laughs> My, how things have changed. So that was the first advisory, and it wouldn't be long that we would eventually uh, leave North Carolina. I want to go back one. If we look at the advisory at 11 a.m. on August the 10th, 2004, it looked like that there was a chance that Charlie could come into the Gulf here and you know just cruise on in, you know maybe affecting somewhere over here. You know back then we didn't have uh, the luxury of the computer models and the. Um, I mean I guess it is three day track area. How about that? <laughs> wow, Tuesday to Friday, and now we have a five day forecast. My goodness, so we didn't have that luxury. And what we also didn't realize at the time was that there was a trough that was going to dig in through this area. Uh, it was going to scoop up Bonnie and take Bonnie away and eventually allow Charlie to turn, uh, not like that into Tampa or even coming up this way, as you'll see, but um, in a more sweeping fashion up the East Coast, the whole East Coast, not just out to sea like this. Uh, kind of like Wilma did in 2005, but the setup was there for something that would affect a lot of people with the direct hit in the Port Charlotte area. And as I go through the different graphics here, this is uh, August the 10th at the 5 o'clock advisory package and so forth and so on. And it's interesting that the August 11th 5 a.m. advisory pretty much nailed it. You see that right there? And I'm going to change the color. We'll use yellow. Uh, so that was what a two-day forecast and you can see where it had landfall right there near Port Charlotte so that was pretty accurate but what happened was it looked like at one point here that this could move farther to the north and you see this one right here it is the August 12th a day before landfall a little a little more than a day it looked as though Charlie could make landfall across Tampa Bay and that was a real nightmare scenario for obvious reasons and the Port Charlotte area which is over here was not really I mean it was in the right front you know quadrant so to speak of course Charlie was small but any change in track you know at this angle meant drastic changes in who was affected and of course as we just keep going through uh, this is the 12th still it was aimed even farther north almost up to the Big Bend area, Tarpon Springs, and so that's where we went. My crew and I, we ended up in the Tarpon Springs area, uh, and this was just, this was a bad scenario for Tampa 
and a lot of people were worried about it. The media was focused on it. It was just not good. And that held on all the way until, uh, let's get on in here, 11 o'clock. So it, that forecast was still there uh, for this to affect. I mean, look at this. This was still forecast to come basically just up and just west of Tampa Bay. I'm going to zoom in real tight. And then uh, not too far to the south and east of Cedar Key, Port Charlotte is right over here. Uh, this is probably not going to let me draw on it because of, yeah, it's just weird. So, you know, any tiny change in track in that angle, you know, just a few degrees over to the right, if you think about it, if due north is zero, moving north, at, you know, moving zero on the compass, or 360, I guess you could say, you know, if you think about a track off to the right uh, to about, you know, 10 degrees, 12 degrees to the right of that, then you get this into Port Charlotte. And that's exactly what happened, as we all remember. And so if we go through, that was the 5 a.m., the 11 a.m. advisory. And this is what's so incredible to me still today, is even at the 11 a.m. advisory that day, I mean, we're talking hours from landfall. There it is. It was still forecast to go over Tampa Bay or very close to it. And Port Charlotte is down here. So, uh, and of course, we know what happened. The rest is history. It did change track uh, pretty abruptly. If we go back, that's the 2 p.m. There's the 11 a.m. There's the 2 p.m. And it was just a subtle change, but it was enough to make history, so to speak. So if we look at the advisories on here, and this is what I want to show you. Let me zoom out just a hair. Um, so the 11 o'clock advisory that morning, Charlie was 110 miles per hour. All right. And hurricane force winds out to 30 miles, et cetera, et cetera. And so at one o'clock, just two hours later, uh, recon got in there and thank goodness they did. <laughs> Imagine if there was no recon and they were just going on satellite. So by 1 p.m. Eastern Time, the winds were up to 125 miles per hour, and they said that these strongest winds are confined to a small area within a few miles from Charlie's center. And again, the winds, hurricane force winds are only out 30 miles, so it was a very small tropical cyclone, very intense but very small. Then, just a little while later, uh, Recon said, oh boy, it's up to a Cat 4, and winds were 145 miles per hour. The pressure continued to drop, and uh, that 954 seems high. We recorded um, lower than that, as you'll see in the, uh, the video. Uh, getting ready to play it in just a minute. And, of course, it made landfall uh, over the Port Charlotte area. They issued a special discussion at that time as well, the recent aircraft and reconnaissance information, radar, satellite, etc., 125 knots, and that set the, the stage for an incredible uh, experience, negative for most people, obviously, uh, damaging $10, $15 billion, whatever it was, lives lost, you know, luckily it was a small hurricane, but we were there, so were other people, um, Greg Nordstrom and Jim Eds. Uh, others were down there, Mike Tice, Jim Reed, and um, Jeff Gammons, a, a group of guys, sort of a small club uh, of people that were in this in different areas within just a few miles of each other around the Port Charlotte area. And we can see that just a little bit here. I want to show you on Jesse Bass page. He did a, a write-up on this 13 years ago. This is Panama City Beach as we were getting ready for Bonnie and people always talking about a hurricane party, etc. Maybe not a wise idea, right? These are just photos that Jesse took as Bonnie moved in. This is the Chevy Tahoe back in the day. Uh, we were supported major funding from Lowe's and we had a big uh, sponsorship and partnership with Sprint as well. And so we were able to afford a lot of technology and to be able to go anywhere we needed to go. Uh, those are the golden days. <laughs> now it's different, <laughs> which is a story for another day. Um, now you just hope you have enough gas to get there. But anyhow, the forecast that morning you see right there was near Tampa. And later on, you see Bonnie coming into the uh, Florida Panhandle up here. And these are just reflections from Bonnie. 
And then it was go time. Hey, gas was a buck seventy-one back then. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? And so here we are on August the thirteenth. Uh, this is our location. We were testing out the XM weather satellite-based weather, thanks to John's uh, very well-reaching uh, sponsorship pitches to people. Barons uh, let us test this mobile threat net. It was XM-based satellite radar. This is before iPhones. So everything was on a laptop, and yeah, we had WeatherTap, of course, but this gave us our GPS location, which is right there. I'm just going to pump this up a little bit. So that's us. It's being rude and not letting me draw on it. That's fine. And then you can see the hurricane down there coming, and you know, wave information. Not That's not hurricane preparedness, by the way. Putting painter's tape on windows, uh, you're wasting your time. You know, wasting your time putting duct tape. I'm sorry. Hey, the tolls were turned off, so that was good. The beaches were empty. This was Bradenton, because we figured it would hit near Bradenton, uh, and which was just south of Tampa, of course. But that wasn't south enough. And we got the uh, message. I mean, there was nobody there. Uh, we got the message around 1 o'clock, 1.30 that afternoon that it's headed for the Port Charlotte area. There I am doing a blog update. What we now know as a blog, back then I just called it commentary. There's Eddie and myself kind of looking at it like, oh crap. And there's different fire rescue people at Bradenton Beach. And there's Eddie readying the mast for the anemometer. We wanted, hey, one lone surfer. We wanted to gather wind data uh, at about 12 feet above ground level. So we took off after we got the call, so to speak. I don't remember who let us know. I don't know if it was Jesse or Eddie or John that got the report that it had strengthened. And so we took off and headed down towards Port Charlotte. These are the radar shots from the mobile threat net. And there's the eye and there's our location there. And uh, we're heading down I-75. Let's see if this will cooperate with me at all to be able to draw on it. Yeah, a little bit. So you see us right there at the top. <laughs> and the eye, interesting, it had this moat around it, so it was like a hurricane within a hurricane. And there it is, closing in on the Port Charlotte area. And then that right there, I'm going to singular out this image. There we are. This white dot right here is us, our location. And then this is the eye and the eye wall of this tiny little area of just devastating wind. Luckily, it missed the Fort Myers area for the worst of it. But it was going to come in right across Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda, etc., and be a really, really nasty event. And these are the different screen captures from Jesse's video, and you know, so forth and so on. Uh, what a day, to say the least. So that's the setup for Charlie. What I'm going to try to do is get this switched over so that I can play the video uh, off of YouTube. I've uploaded a special higher quality version that's already on there and uh, hopefully it'll play fingers crossed that this will work and you can hear the audio and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play it's literally the raw DVD program that I pulled off the DVD and uploaded to YouTube again uh, and I rendered it just a little bit higher quality it's not high definition because we didn't have HD back then um, and so I'm gonna open this with the beginning of the DVD to set things up and then we're going to skip ahead to Charlie. Alright, so before I do that, let me just switch back over to this source, see if you have any thoughts or questions on the chat before we get started. And the answer is... <laughs> good, just very, very good chatting with people, that's awesome. The late Jim Leonard was also there, that's exactly right, near the bank. A uh, small group of us that were there, and we will never forget. So, all right, so let me get over here to YouTube, and hopefully this will work. I'm going to start here, see if we have an ad. Okay, good. All right, so back at the time, like I said, hopefully we still have audio. Back at the time, uh, you know, we had these two major sponsorships with... Turn on chat on YouTube, it hasn't been on. Yes, hold on. It's letting somebody know that it is. Sorry. 
Um, major sponsorship partnership with Lowe's and Sprint, and uh, they were very instrumental in funding what we were able to do uh, to get us the equipment that we needed, not only to document, you know, from video cameras, that's important, but I really wanted the weather data as well. And so the equipment that we were using, you'll see some of that was part of that. So what I want to do is switch this audio so that we hear the YouTube and let's just hope for the best. So we'll change audio. All right. All right let's just see what happens. I'm going to play it. Hopefully this will work. So there's the setup of the first part of the DVD, and I'm saying we're getting some echo. I'm trying to see if I can kill my microphone and still have the system audio play. Uh, if so, then we are going to be in luck here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to mute me, and so you're going to see me talking without my lips moving, and then we'll know that part worked. All right, so good. Let's see. Well, it shows me over here on the output is still picking it up. That's weird. Um, hmm. So let's go back over to the other source and see if we can get this. Change audio. Don't need the microphone part working for that. All right, let's see if it works from here without the echo. Just a few days after Alex, Bonnie had formed, followed closely behind by Charlie. August was getting off to a very quick start. For the dual mission of Bonnie and Charlie, I was going to work with the full Hurricane Intercept Research Team crew. Eddie Smith of Elkin, North Carolina, joined me in Wilmington, as did Jesse Bass from Portsmouth, Virginia. Nice. John Van Pelt would rendezvous with us in Florida. 
Our initial plan was to head to Panama City Beach, Florida, and wait for Bonnie. Hi, I'm Mark Suddeth with HurricaneTrack.com on our first video update for Bonnie and Charlie. It's uh, about 10.15 p.m. and we're getting the Tahoe here ready to go. I've been updating the website all day today. I had a hurricane conference I had to speak at. Uh, bad grammar there, but I did speak at a hurricane conference. Um, we're getting ready to head down to Panama City, Florida for Bonnie. As you can see from the National Hurricane Center forecast track, it looks like Bonnie could come in very close to Panama City. How strong it is when we get there, we just don't know yet. And then after Bonnie, we'll be dealing with Tropical Storm Charlie, which will probably be a hurricane, and we'll be able to bring you information as well as webcam images. Here's a shot of our webcam. You can't see much through here right now. But we'll leave all this on 24-7 uh, if we can, and you can track right along with us, and we'll do these video updates as often as possible as we track Bonnie and Charlie. For HurricaneTrack.com, there's the phone. It's Jesse. Uh, I'm Mark Suddeth, and uh, stay tuned. We'll have more later. And so the all-too-familiar trip south had commenced once again for the team. Eddie, Jesse, and I made it to Charleston, South Carolina on the night of August the 10th. The next day, we took off again for our destination in Florida. Yeah. Bonnie formed from the remnants of Tropical Depression II, which itself formed on August the 3rd, as we were on the Outer Banks dealing with Alex. Bonnie was not very well organized and was generally a small tropical storm. It moved slowly towards the northeast Gulf Coast from about the 9th of August until its landfall on the 12th. The impacts from Bonnie were indeed minimal. However, the tropical storm did bring flooding rains and severe weather to Florida and the Carolinas. Unfortunately, three people lost their lives in a tornado spawned near my hometown of Wilmington, North Carolina, as Bonnie moved through early on the morning of Friday, August the 13th. As Bonnie moved deep inland, Eddie, Jesse, and I left the panhandle of Florida to meet up with John and get ready for our mission with Charlie. All right, here we are at Interstate 75. It's 2.45 in the afternoon, Eastern Time. And as you can see, it's raining pretty good. This is a band from Tropical Storm Bonnie. You can see the really heavy rain there in the distance. We're in the southbound lane of I-75. Take a look at the northbound lane over here. And there's not that much evacuation traffic right now, but the rain is really coming down. There, it's letting up now, right on cue. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a look at what it looks like as we travel south towards Tarpon Springs for our mission with Charlie. Hi, I'm Mark Suddeth with HurricaneTrack.com. Here we are finally in Tarpon Springs, Florida, uh, waiting for Hurricane Charlie that will be rolling in here about this time tomorrow night. We hope that everybody's going to be ready. Anybody watching this video that lives anywhere in the projected landfall path, it's very important for you to heed the advice of your local officials. They know what they're doing. They have their hurricane plans, and they know how to get you out safely. Throughout the evening of August the 12th, the crew and I checked and rechecked equipment to prepare for what was to come. Little did we know that the next day would change our lives forever. As we now know, Hurricane Charlie was a Category 4 hurricane at landfall. It tracked across the Atlantic and through the Caribbean Sea where it slammed into the western portion of Cuba. By early in the morning of Friday, August 13th, Charlie was still forecast to strike close to the Tampa Bay area. However, as the day progressed, it became clear that Charlie had other plans. Notice here that Charlie crossed extremely warm water temperatures as indicated by the reddish blobs near the southwest coast of Florida. This was about the same time that the hurricane went from a Category 2 to a Category 4. Let's go back to the night of August the 12th our last night before the landfall of Charlie. Not under the mandatory evacuation for the entire island, but there are several areas 
And people need to be aware of it. If they're in a Category 2 storm evacuation area because of flooding, they, that's the people that need to leave. So if they live along water areas or particularly along the coast and they fall into that Category 2 flooding or a Category 2 type storm, those are the folks that need to be evacuating from the island area of Venice. It is now early in the morning on Friday, August the 13th. The rest of the crew is still asleep as I shoot video of the new day. The forecast track for Charlie has shifted some, and we will head south to Bradenton Beach. Tampa Bay is going to get off this time, but areas farther south will not be so lucky. Charlie is still many hours away and we feel confident about our new location. Most people have evacuated and the area was a proverbial ghost town. The local police, fire and rescue folks are extremely helpful and are interested in what we're doing. Had Charlie struck them head on, we would have been able to send real-time data and imagery to their local emergency operations center. Oh, look at that. Wow. We've got four rings four right on the center. It's a 69. As it turned wow. out, Charlie pulled somewhat of a fast one on us all and headed towards Charlotte Harbor. So we packed up, said goodbye to our new friends in Bradenton Beach, and headed south along I-75. Hi, I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. Big change in plans all of a sudden. It's a Category 4 hurricane. Eddie, if you'll look up there. You see the anemometer, it's all ready to go. And now, Eddie, if you'll pan around and look at the interstate, that is I-75 right there at the intersection. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get on I-75 and we're gonna head south. We're gonna let the eye come over us in the eye wall, but we're gonna get near an overpass situation. We can be prepared to take shelter if we can. Unlike a tornado, hopefully we can get under the overpass and we won't have to worry about too much wind funneling but the interstate won't get flooded by the storm surge, and that's what we have to avoid the most. We can hide from the wind, but we cannot run from the water if we're too close to it, and we have to be really careful. So we're going to head south on I-75 near Fort Myers and try to keep reporting from there. For HurricaneTrack.com, I'm Mark Sutton near Venice, Florida. We'll report to you more later. The entire crew followed I-75 south to exit number 170, not far from Punta Gorda. This was the best location that we could find considering the short time we had to plan. At least we were not near water and we were not near a major population center. Nevertheless, what happened next will remain with us always. Oh man, look at that. Oh, shoot! 100! 100, 112! We gotta back, we gotta up. back we're up. Gonna lose the we're gonna lose the window. 
though. We gotta back up, Julio. We're gonna get under this overpass and try to get some stuff around. Excuse me, dude. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Right. The vehicle. Oh my goodness. Holy shoot. You getting this, Jesse? 122. gets 965 on the pressure guys we should be in the eye shortly i hope where is it jesse i don't know i don't have coverage it stopped working it's going. please you got to get us in the eye hold it up on the laptop okay you stay with me jeff oh power flash or something something blew up over there Ah, we're getting hit with debris. Here comes more debris. All right, we'll be right here. Bye. Oh, are you joking me? They call me better off if I get beside you in case something comes off. My yeah, he should get beside. Guys, just keep taping, no matter what. Keep taping. Oh my God. I'm glad we're not near the ocean, buddy. We would have died today. Absolutely. Holy cow, stuff is coming apart. We are getting pounded. Oh, man, stuff's hitting the vehicle big time. Almost right on top of us. We're going to go through the eye in just a minute, guys. The worst is almost over. It's almost over. Unbelievable. If I'm going to do this again. Oh, 
Uh-oh. Eddie, see if you can get us near that piling right there. Get us Correct. that piling right there so the stuff won't hit us. Yeah. That's your tank. Tornado is the eye of the hurricane. You won't have a tornado in the eye. That was 140 mile an hour wind. Look at all that. No, I did piss myself. Oh, it was lie. unbelievable. Oh, God. We got the oh, coming too, guys. Over there. Uh, should we go? Should we? Should we? No, you're gonna have to stay put. Oh, Kevin. Yeah, we need to get back underneath this damn thing. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. This is beautiful. Well, we're in the eye right now. As soon as we can do it, because this place is heavily damaged. It is horrible. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. I'm so A sign of there's obliterated that Hampton Inn sign. Oh, yeah. That canopy at that racetrack, gone. Ripped off. This is the eye of Hurricane Charlie. This is Mark Seventh with the Hurricane Intercept Research Team. Uh, shaking. We just went through the eye wall of the hurricane on uh, Interstate 75. Sure. Then we want to back up. Absolutely. If, if you. Yes. Come yeah, on. Yeah, but back. the other side's getting ready to come through. I mean, we can see it coming. How's the back side of the eye? Uh, one of them was the other, the one that records data was destroyed. The one that doesn't wasn't. All right, the other one got ripped off the mast. Hey, what's the other side look like? Not as bad as the other side? Thank goodness. Man, just like that, I was trying to zoom in. Yeah. Tower still working. Can you hear me? We are getting video of that now. 
Yeah, that they were gonna call me back, but then they never did for the uh, thing. But they probably couldn't get me because it's. What was that? The the. Oh, you get this video right here. Oh yeah. Keep going. Look at that building completely got, destroyed. I got. Yeah. 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 Oh, we've been building, building. All right, we can't. Yeah, you got three all over the road. All right, all right, all right. All right, we're Together we had survived the most intense weather that any of us had ever been in. There was no appreciable damage to our vehicles, so off we went to catch up with Charlie as it plowed inland towards Orlando, probably the only time that I have ever actually chased a hurricane. Uh oh breaking. It was an upside down Disney World sign. Having caught up to a much weaker hurricane than we had just witnessed, Charlie still packed quite a punch. to beat Charlie back to North Carolina, but it was literally unsafe for us to go that long with no sleep. So Charlie is the only hurricane to have hit North Carolina since 1993 that I wasn't there for. The season's second hurricane beat me back to my hometown of Wilmington, North Carolina. Ironically, I was in the exact center of Charlie in Florida twice, once near Punta Gorda and a second time on I-4. I could have been in the eye of the same hurricane on three different occasions, but two will have to suffice for now. All right, so there you go. There's Hurricane Charlie 13 years ago. Wow, what an, what an experience. Um, great to see a good amount of people watching. You imagine going to a room and you have 85, 90 people sitting in it to watch something that you put together. Uh, that was nice to have that many people watching today. And, of course, many thousands more over the years since I posted that on YouTube. Um, I want to take a little bit of time to do sort of a question and answer session with you guys on the YouTube chat, so I'm going to unplug the iPad and put it right up here in front of me 
so that I can look down at the chat while I'm talking to you all. Um, let's see what else. Folks just bring in, yeah, it brings back memories, etc. Yeah, so uh, before we go to the questions and you know give you some answers, hopefully. So a lot has obviously changed since Charlie. Uh, we did collect some very valuable wind data and that ended up in the National Hurricane Center uh, post tropical cyclone report on Charlie and you know, it's very risky obviously and yes I was very frightened I think most of us were that were there and you know it's fine to be frightened if you're not frightened I think that uh, you don't have enough respect for what you're dealing with or you're just numb to it and it really after that moment on propelled us to start doing the remote camera idea uh, which would take another year or so to implement and it would be ready by the time we got to Katrina in late August of 2005. And, you know, you go through something like that and you see the power. Uh, the wind really does scare me because you can't see it coming. Uh, not those big downburst stabs. Uh, Josh Morgerman, for example, he loves that wind. The harder the wind is blowing, uh, I just that that explosive wind I just I can't deal with that because you don't have any time to react I'd rather deal in terms of documenting and studying visually the storm surge and that's why we have created these unmanned cameras but we also do have the anemometer system and we you know we had that in place on the vehicle it was vehicle mounted back then and we still have vehicle mounted wind equipment now but that's more for you know, spot locator winds or whatever, you know, just going somewhere for a spot reading. Um, everything now is smaller, mobile, and we can do it live. That's a huge difference from back then. Um, what else? Uh, you know, so after Charlie, of course, the season kept on going. We had Francis, we had Gaston, and some of our data helped to have Gaston upgraded from a tropical storm to a hurricane because we were in the center of Gaston near Bulls Bay in South Carolina where we recorded a 985 millibar air pressure and you know that's that's all good that's what we want to do is to be able to contribute to the science so it's very very unnerving the best way to describe how that felt you know you go there there's the adrenaline the excitement you know this desire to be in a hurricane and for me to document not only the visual aspect of it, but also that data, very, very important to me. Um, and all of that really starts to get encapsulated and then sort of put aside that excitement as fear starts to creep in. Fear because we are no longer in control of our destiny once the wind reaches those wind speeds that they did. We're in the vehicle, it's a big Chevy Tahoe, the nose of it is aimed into the wind, and so there is aerodynamics involved and there's three of us in that vehicle John was in his own vehicle a Dodge truck and you know luckily those were heavy vehicles you don't stick them broadside to the wind so you get hit from the side you don't move around during that kind of wind you stay still and you hope for the best <laughs> and we got lucky um, we were out in the open for the most part on purpose uh, the idea was to get you know under the overpass for protection and the worst of it and before that happened, we did manage to record a wind gust to 133 miles per hour. And we were literally just out from under the top of the overpass. So the wind was hitting the anemometer first before it would hit the overpass 10, 20 feet behind us. But once it got too violent and we started th seeing things flying, we backed up and went under the overpass and put as much overpass and embankment and those uh, concrete columns between us and the fetch of wind coming across that industrial complex uh, just over there where the Hampton Inn was. And thank goodness because sheet metal, pipes, you know, shingles, who knows what, uh, could have definitely impacted us and caused some serious damage to the truck. Um, I did want to show you, I want to go back to Jesse's page, some of the damage in still pictures. Uh, I guess I better switch over to that other source if I'm going to do that.
incorporate. Yeah, so I'll just have to show you the pictures because the audio is not going to come back on for me. So I'm going to go over to the other source, show you the pictures, and yeah, I lose my audio. You can see some of these pictures here. So on that one there that I just showed of the concrete structure that was totally collapsed, uh, the doors blew in, the wind got inside, and the walls collapsed. You know, that is a very common thing when you have poor wind mitigation in place. But then on these pictures here um, that show the condos, the houses, whatever they are over there, you know, they had really good mitigation, the hurricane shutters, etc. Um, so some people did do stuff that was right, and it, you know, they had very little damage, just some vegetative damage. The roofs didn't come off, the windows were protected. The home was a solid entity, and the wind was not able to knock those windows out allowing the pressure to come in from the outside and then the uh, pressure over the top of the roof creating like a lifting effect and you know some people had very little damage other places were completely destroyed uh, let me go back to the chat <clears throat> real quick and let's see what folks are talking about um, Just reading through the different chat here, etc. Well, Tomato, I like what you say, and in that regard, I try to get that message out that, you know, hurricanes are inherently an exciting thing. That doesn't make them positive, doesn't mean that it's a good thing, but, um, you know, people get excited about them, and a lot of people misunderstand. Uh, what hurricanes are capable of doing, especially uh, these major hurricanes like Charlie. So, you know, we really try to keep things straightforward, emphasize the science, keep the uh, the hype out of it. You know, if we see a Katrina coming, we're going to let you know. And you know, the way I look at it, if we're showing up in your city, your area, specifically your neighborhood, with some of our remote cameras, that's a bad sign. I'll just put it that way. Um, all right, so we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I got to go do some. I'm going to take the kids. I got kids. Uh, back then, I had four kids. Is that right? Yes, four kids, and now I have seven kids. <laughs> so how about that? So Tomato asked, in your opinion, Mark, what is the worst hurricane you've ever experienced? Uh, like you were there when it was going down. So Charlie was definitely the most intense, no question about it, but Katrina was the most devastating as you could imagine uh, overall the damage from Katrina and um, uh, you know obviously that's the most damaging hurricane the United States has ever seen so yeah but Charlie was the most intense and I think the best way to describe that the eye wall and the worst part like I said we had no control at that point you can't just get out and leave the truck you know where are you gonna go so imagine you're on, and if any of you are getting ready to fly in the next few days or whatever, I'm sorry about this, but you're on your American Airlines flight or your whoever, Delta, and you hit severe turbulence, and you just have that feeling like you're going to die. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, I have no control at this point. It's up to the pilots and the aircraft structure, etc. And we've all been there. And Charlie was like that for about 40 minutes <laughs> where you just feel like everything outside the vehicle is lethal at that point and if anything bad happens we could be severely injured or killed but I, I, I never felt like I was gonna die though that's the thing it was more of a um, I want to get off the ride kind of thing you know uh oh what have I done that kind of thing but I honestly didn't feel like my life was in danger like this is the end because I think then you start becoming more subdued and you probably realize that there's this mortal danger it's, it's it was more of a fight or flight reflex you know where you're holding on for dear life because you feel like you're just gonna go airborne so 
Uh, but I'm going to wrap it up. Like I said, I'm going to take the kids to the beach. Uh, it's nice and muggy and uh, whatnot out on Wrightsville Beach. And the water temperatures are warm. And it's mid-August. And school starts in about a week or so. A little over a week for them. So we're going to do some fun stuff. Before I go, uh, and first of all, thanks for tuning in for this Charlie um, revisit. I do appreciate it. You know, I guess this is a good idea. Uh, if we don't have a hurricane threat, you know, or whatever on a specific date where something big happened that we were in and I can do this again, I'll be glad to. I think this is neat. Um, obviously watching 91L out in the Atlantic. You saw my video update today, hopefully. Um, and of course with GERT, not going to be a problem for any land areas, though. Hopefully it will send some surf and swells our way and the surf community can take advantage of that as long as people are careful and remember that that can create some rip currents. We have the eclipse, the Great American Eclipse coming up, and I just want to kind of throw this at you. Let's say 91L fully develops and becomes an intense hurricane. Now, a lot of the European models, and I saw the stuff today, Ryan Maui talked about it that you know has sort of that westward track look to it, but, and I'm not worried about that it would hit the U.S. during the eclipse. I think there's too much time uh, or not enough time between now, too much distance to cover for it to get here. But if the hurricane, and assuming it's a hurricane, I'm going out on a limb here, uh, is just a few hundred miles off the southeast coast near South Carolina, let's say, but safely away, you have all that upward motion in the middle, and then you have sinking motion on the outside. That's called subsidence. That would give Charleston and areas maybe even as far west as Columbia almost absolutely clear skies, believe it or not. And if you don't believe me, what are you talking about? Now, certainly the outflow could come out, but that would be a high cirrus canopy, and that might inhibit things a little bit, provide a natural filter. But September 11th, the terror attacks were successful, partly because there was a hurricane off the New England coast, and the subsidence from that Cat 3 hurricane and the overall environment around it gave for very clear skies for planes to do what they needed to do to take off that day in the operational mode there were not enough delays etc so had the weather been worse ch history might have changed and hurricane Aaron, i think was its name had a part to do with that believe it or not you should check that out sometime and so maybe for the eclipse what would become potentially harvey right hurricane harvey if it gets close enough you know i don't want to say in hits because I don't want to seem too pro-hurricane, but if it's close enough, you get the out of the uh, subsidence, that could be a very positive thing. Uh, because this trough and this low-pressure front thing that's over the southeast now, uh, it's just time for it to go. All right, so we'll be watching everything. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, hey, it's been awesome chatting with you. Tomorrow, uh, Monday, we start looking at what's happening. GERT will be on its way out, and we'll keep up with 91L. It looks like a very busy time coming up in the tropics. And you never know, several years from now or whatever, we might be doing a re, uh, revisit to some other infamous hurricane on YouTube chatting with you fine folks. Have a great rest of your Sunday and the great uh, rest of your weekend, whatever you're going to do with it. I'm Like I said, I'm going to the beach. I'm Mark Settle for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to all that we do. And I will be back with you again tomorrow with more.